this Christian who was a very learned scholar, he said, well, I have the Jewish understanding of Satan, that Satan is one of God's angels and can't do anything without his mm. permission and without his authority. And on the spot, the man was fired, not for denying Jesus, not for denying the Father or the Holy Spirit, but the Christian man was fired for denying Satan. Welcome to Hebrew Gospel Pearls, Episode 9. We are looking at Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 11. This is a really, really, really exciting uh, passage that we're going to be looking at. And I'm pretty convinced that as we get into this, we're going to, it's just going to go to the depths. Now, Nehemia, before we get started, I have to do something. I have mm -hmm. to start with something that your cousin <laughs> actually wrote. And normally we don't do this, folks. Usually we get into it, we warm up. Yeah. But there's going to be so much information. I know that when we push the button, <laughs> Nehemia, tell me, Nehemia, are you excited for this passage before I get started here? I'm very excited. Excellent. Yeah, this, okay. this is a very interesting passage on so many levels. Oh, so many, yeah. so many levels. So we're going to yeah. try to do what we always do. We're going to start with the, with, with the beginning, and we'll see how far we get. And then, of course, we're going to be in the uh, plus episode. But the reason I want to start with your cousin is that um, mm -hmm. I did something that we don't normally do when Nehemia and I are studying. We actually had a little conversation uh, yesterday, I think it was, as we were preparing for this. And I asked him a question, and it's it's kind of an obvious question. Um, I guess it's an obvious question. Um, how uh, the Jewish perspective looks at this issue of what we call the tempter or the devil. Now, the reason I want to start with this is because I know we're going to get right into mm -hmm. it. But can I just can I just read the first part of what your cousin? I'm looking at your cousin's book. If you guys don't know about yeah. the cousin's book at this point, you you are you need to start over. Okay. <laughs> I just want to go to well, one let, little Let's just thing. tell people what it is, because there might be people starting here. Okay, well, tell, it's a tell book them what called it is, Nehemiah. The Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament, written around 1879 by Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik. Mm -hmm. It was just translated in 2019 into English, mm -hmm. written in Hebrew, and it is considered the first Jewish commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, yeah. or actually on anything in the New Testament. Awesome. He's literally my second cousin five times removed. <laughs> <laughs> Nehemiah's cousin. We call it his cousin's book. He does mm -hmm. something really interesting. Okay. Now, usually I ask you to do this, Nehemiah. Would you be willing to just read the first verse in the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew? Would you just Absolutely. read that for us out loud? Excellent. Now, Can I translate it? is it fair to say that your cousin is not looking at a Hebrew manuscript when he's doing the, this, uh, this, this, this commentary? <laughs> Well, that's interesting. So they, they talk about that. The translator talks about that in the introduction. Yeah. And it seems he didn't know Greek. Mm -hmm. And so it, he probably was using a French translation. Mm -hmm. He did a lot of this work in, when he was in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, he may have also consulted a Yiddish translation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's at least one passage that we already saw where he mentions the French translator. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, yeah. So let me, let me just give you all his translation from assuming he's looking at a translation from Greek. Then the spirit carried Yeshua into the wilderness so that the Satan could test him. And the reason I had to stop mm -hmm. is he says, so that the Satan yeah. could test him. And I asked you a question yesterday. I said, Nehemiah, so for me, my background when I'm reading this in the English, if, can I just go real quickly to my English version? The sure. English version, folks, I've got all these books here. I want to read this. It says, and I think it's like 18 words. It says, then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, your mm -hmm. cousin is not looking at a Hebrew text, I'm assuming. He's only looking at a translation that's from Greek. Right. And even he wouldn't fall into the trap that our friend Howard fell into. Can I, can I look at Howard? What was his, what, what did he fall into? Okay, let me, just, let me just read Howard real quick, folks. Um, Matthew chapter four, then Jesus was taken by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by, drum roll please, not the Satan, but by capital S-A-T-A-N. Now, the reason uh -huh. I wanted to bring your cousin Howard's translation, certainly Howard is making a decision as he's looking at the Hebrew, he's making an English translation that I personally I, I'm, I'm not real happy with what he did. But, but can you tell me why it is that your cousin would immediately see Satan or the devil or whatever you would say that it would be, and he still translated it as 
he gives it the definite article the, and that Howard sees ha satan right in the Hebrew, and yet he capitalizes s a t a n. Now this is starting controversy right off the top, but I want to ask you about this. What is your thought? Well, let's start with what it says in Greek. Mm -hmm. So Greek has the word diabolu, mm -hmm. which is nominative form for those who know what that is is diabolos, mm -hmm. which means devil. Um, even we say in English, diabolical, right? We, we have the same word. And then both Matthew and Luke have the same exact word. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke uh, 4 2 has the same thing as Matthew 4 1, mm -hmm. that he's tempted by the devil. And so it's interesting here that it's, they translate it as hasatan. Now, hasatan uh, in Hebrew, uh, we have this rule that you cannot identify a, a personal name by adding hey to it, or you cannot, what's called, uh, make it, uh, you can't. It's, determ it's called determination. That's mm -hmm. the term, determination. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, personal names are already determined. In other words, the name Keith, the name Nehemiah, the name John, the name uh, Sally, you can't say in Hebrew, uh, the Sally. Now I, now I can in English, right? In English I can say, uh, which Sally was it? Um, the tall one or the short one? You'd say, uh, it was the Sally who is short. You mm -hmm. can say that in English. Right. In Hebrew, I can't say ha Sally, mm -hmm. ha Yeshua. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, that's actually really important when we're looking at Hebrew manuscripts of the New Testament, of which there are many, it's a couple dozen, maybe more. Uh, if we ever see something like ha Yeshua, the Yeshua, <laughs> we immediately know this is a translation from Greek. Because in Greek, you can do that. In Greek, you can say, um, in fact, you often would say, ho Yesus. Um, so the Jesus, right, or the Jesus. Um, so, so the fact that it's Ha-Satan tells you that Satan is not his name, Satan is his title. Mm -hmm. That's all, all that is to say, Satan is a title if it says Ha-Satan here in the Hebrew. That's true in the Tanakh as well. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, in Job, mm -hmm. we have a very interesting passage <laughs> where he's referred to as Ha-Satan. Mm -hmm. And, and the, what's a bit strange about it for some people is, well, he's a character who hasn't been introduced before, mm -hmm. right? So, so often you would uh, identify someone as the if they've already been introduced in the, th the story, right? Mm -hmm. You could say an angel came along and he said such, and then you'd say the angel, mm -hmm. right? Because he was introduced in an earlier verse. Mm -hmm. Well, in Job, he's just called, um, uh, maybe we can read that. Um, it says Job 1.6, one day, this is a JPS, one day the divine beings, I love that. In the Hebrew, it's B'nei Elohim, mm -hmm. the sons of God. Uh, I'll just read the, from the Hebrew. Uh, and it came to pass on, on the day, and um, and here we have the day, which day, right? So it's the same linguistic phenomenon with Hasatan here, mm -hmm. uh, as I'll explain in a minute. And it came to pass the day, and the sons of Elohim came to stand before uh, Yehovah, and also the Satan came among them. So mm -hmm. what is this the Satan if you haven't identified the Satan yet? So the linguistic explanation that you'll find this in Gazenius, the Hebrew grammar, uh, Muraoka, which is a wonderful Hebrew grammar also explains this, is that it means a certain. If you identify a character mm -hmm. with ha, uh, and you haven't, and he hasn't been seen before in, this, in, in the story, in the scene, then it means a certain Satan, mm -hmm. which is how I would translate it here. Uh, here, let's read it. Then Yeshua was taken by the Holy Spirit to the desert to be uh, tested, says, we'll get to that, uh, by a certain Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and now, but Satan can't be his name or you wouldn't say Ha Satan. Right. Uh, for personal names of people that are or individuals, that's not how it works. So you can do that with geographical names, mm -hmm. but you can't do that with uh, uh, individuals. Um, it's actually uh, something that was brought up uh, years ago when they discovered this inscription in Sinai, in a place called Kuntalet Adrud. And it's one of the first references to Yehovah outside the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. And it mentions there Yehovah ve'asherato, and his asherah. <laughs> and saying his with a suffix is like saying ha, the. It's a form of determination. And they concluded from that that it can't be the name asherah, but asherah there has to be the object. Mm -hmm. Right? There is a, a goddess called asherah, but if you say Yehovah and his Asherah, which of course is horrible blasphemy, <laughs> that's what the inscription says. They're identifying Yehovah as Baal. Baal has an Asherah. Mm -hmm. You mean an Asherah is the pole next to the altar of Yehovah or altar of Baal originally. Um, and so that's the, the pole that, that uh, Gideon cut down, the Asherah. Mm -hmm. So when you say his Asherah, it's like saying the Satan. 
Asherah is not the name, it is the title. Yes. Or in that case, it's the, the object, the pole. In this case, Hasatan is his, is his role, his title. Mm -hmm. He is a certain Satan. Mm -hmm. So here's, there's, there's, here's what happens. Nehemiah, in this first verse, uh, I think there are three simple things that I hope we'll yeah. discuss. Three yeah. simple things that we'll discuss that the yeah. Hebrew Gospel of Matthew can um, help us get some clarity on. So just by yeah. looking at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, and I know for a fact that you're going to be able to bring a lot of other things around this, but just yeah. by looking at the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew in the first verse that you just looked at, the first thing that, that for me, that hit me, was it was taken, and then it, it says in English here, by the Holy Spirit, but the, but the actual form there uh, in yeah. the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, uh, when it says Holy Spirit, what do you have? And I don't know if there are other manuscripts that are different than this. Well, so, so the vowel, it's not vocalized, so it could be translated or could be read as Baruch HaKadosh, mm -hmm. the Spirit of Holiness, or, no, or the Holy Spirit, or Baruch HaKodesh, mm -hmm. the Spirit of Holiness. They're very similar. Mm -hmm. It's two different forms, Kadosh and Kodesh. There are places where this phrase is used in Hebrew Matthew, Mm -hmm. And it's spelled out with uh, what we call a, a plene, uh, that is the full form where it's kuf vav dalad shin, mm -hmm. and that tells you it's hakodesh. Mm -hmm. In this one, it's ambiguous, mm -hmm. at least in the manuscripts that, that we're basing it on here. I, I want to go back to the Satan thing. There's a second possible way of reading this. Mm -hmm. If it says ha satan, it could be like ha elohim. Mm -hmm. When you say ha elohim, the elohim, you don't mean a certain elohim, a certain god. Uh, usually, you might in some cases. What you mean is Elohim par excellence, right? Mm -hmm. You mean the, with a capital G, God. Mm -hmm. And so it could be the Satan. In other words, uh, it is possible that the, the author of this text believed there was a certain angel who was the enemy, because mm -hmm. Satan means enemy or adversary. Mm -hmm. And that it was enemy with a capital E, or in the JPS, they'll often have adversary with a capital A, um, the adversary. That is, he is the Satan par excellence. That is a possible interpretation here. Mm -hmm. What's interesting is when he addresses him in verse 10, and I know I'm jumping ahead, he calls him Hasatan. Yes. Right? He, Satan is still not his name. So whether it's Hasatan, the Satan with a capital S, Satan par excellence, or it is meaning the, the main, the, the angel with the title Satan, or it's a certain Satan, because there could be many angels called Satan, mm -hmm. or many entities called Satan. That have that title, uh, it's clearly not his name, which is becoming in um, in English, and it became in English probably because in the interestingly in the Greek, they um, they uh, they transliterate it often. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look in the Greek text of the New Testament, let's just do this live while we're uh, <laughs> uh, record. We'll do, we'll do this on the spot here. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pull up here my Greek text of the New Testament, the Nestle Allen 28. I'm going to type in Greek. Satanas, uh, and the, the noun appears 33 times in the New Testament mm -hmm. in the Nestle Allen 28 text, 33 times. Um, and uh, let's see. Well, interestingly, uh, Mark 8, 33, <laughs> I love that one. We'll get, we'll, we'll get to that uh, maybe later. Um, well, let's read it. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said to him, get behind me, Satan. Now is Peter Satan? No, it's it's uh, it means enemy. It means adversary here. Mm -hmm. um, it never loses its literal meaning, just like the Hebrew word malach, angel, mm -hmm. never loses its literal meaning as well. Meaning it, there's two types of angels in the in the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. There's malach, angel, who is a human, like Balak, the king of Midian, sends a messenger. And that's called a malach. Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, or, or in contrast, there's a malach, which is a spiritual entity that disappears in a wisp of smoke mm -hmm. in the book of Judges. Mm -hmm. Right? So that literal meaning is still there. Satan here is the enemy. Mm -hmm. Now, whose enemy is he? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, that's um, probably something that I think uh, Christianity today departs from Judaism. Christianity tends to see Satan as God's enemy. Mm -hmm. Here's the way it was described to me by, um, by a gentleman who was a prayer warrior. Mm -hmm. This was a man who used to travel all over the United States, and he would blow his shofar, mm -hmm. and, he would, and he would walk and do prayer walks. I said, well, wh what's the prayer walk, and why are you blowing the shofar? He would actually go to the highest place in every county in the United States, 
and he'd gone to hundreds of counties, mm -hmm. and he would blow his shofar. And I said, well, what is the function of blowing the shofar there? And he explained to me, and I'm not saying all Christians believe this, this is what he believed. He explained to me that Satan is gathering forces for the final showdown with God. Mm -hmm. And you can be on Satan's team or you can be on Jesus' team. You can choose sides. Mm -hmm. And Satan rules this world. And so as he travels around blowing the shofar and walking in prayer, like he'll literally map out the streets and walk up, make sure he covers every street and pray as he's praying. And he's proclaiming that territory for God against Satan mm -hmm. so that when the final showdown come, mm -hmm. comes, God has more territory and more, more minions, more soldiers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, to me, it's um, definitely an alien concept. Mm -hmm. Because as I see it in the Tanakh, Satan is not God's enemy. Satan works for God. You see that in Job. He appears before God, and of course, he's trying to make trouble. He's going to and fro in the earth. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, yeah, Job only uh, listens to you because you're good to him. Let's, let us let me harm him. right? Satan wants to cause trouble, but he wants to cause trouble to men, not to God, to mm -hmm. humans. The first time Satan is, can we talk about the first time Satan appears in the Tanakh? Absolutely. Are we ready to jump to that? Okay. So, um, the first time Satan appears in the Tanakh is Numbers 22, 22. And there, it's really interesting. Uh, uh, it's interesting on so many different levels. Uh, um, I'm sure we talked about it in Torah Pearls, mm -hmm. but let's just briefly look at it again. The first time Satan appears in the Tanakh, or that is the word Satan, referring to a spiritual entity, because often Satan is, is um, um, a human, mm -hmm. right? It says that God raised up a certain person as a Satan against Solomon, mm -hmm. right? That was an enemy, an actual adversary. Mm -hmm. uh, but the first spiritual one is Numbers 22, 22, and the anger of God burned uh, because Balaam went, and in, and Malach Yehovah stood in the way, Lisatan lo, as a Satan against him. Yes. And some people have said every time it has the phrase Malach Yehovah in the Tanakh, it's a specific angel. Um, I won't get into that right now. That's what they. That's what some people have claimed mm -hmm. that it's a specific angel because it, it really you would translate Malach Yehovah as the angel of Yehovah. Um, or you could translate also as a certain angel of Yehovah, is based on the principle we just talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but Malach Yehovah stands as a Satan against him, against who? Against against Balaam, mm -hmm. right? So the one who pulls out the sword and the, and the donkey tries to avoid it, and he and he hits the donkey. That is described as a Satan. Mm -hmm. um, now who is he? He's not God Satan. And then again, Numbers twenty two thirty two, mm -hmm. he says the angel says, "Hine anochi atzati Satan. Behold, I have gone out as a Satan." Mm -hmm. Right, so so um, this Satan is not uh, God's enemy; he's actually man's enemy. He's there to test man, mm -hmm. to incite man to sin. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually one of the really interesting uses of the word Satan in the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. If if we can look at that, okay, two Samuel twenty four, and there we actually won't see Satan. Interestingly, all right, twenty four one, and then we're going to look at, we're going to compare that with um, with First uh, Chronicles 21.1, mm -hmm. which tell the exact same story about David counting the people of Israel. Mm -hmm. And verse 24.1 of Second Samuel says, the anger of Jehovah continued to burn against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, go count Israel and Judah. Mm -hmm. Who's the he here? Pretty clear in the context, it's Jehovah, or you could say it's the anger of Jehovah may be personified. But it's Yehovah. First Chronicles 21, 1. So you could translate it, a Satan stood against Israel, and he incited David to count Israel. Mm -hmm. So who stood against Israel in First Chronicles 21, 1? Mm -hmm. Satan. Mm -hmm. But in 2 Samuel 24, 1, it's Yehovah is inciting Israel. Mm -hmm. And what's going on here? First of all, it's a play on words. The word to incite is Vayaset. Mm -hmm which is from a different root, but it sounds like Satan. Mm -hmm. And so 1 Chronicles 21.1 is explaining to us essentially mm -hmm. that God in, uh, tested or incited David, mm -hmm. uh, and basically put him into a test mm -hmm. uh, because, he, because he had this anger against Israel. And how did he do it? He sent his pit bull, mm -hmm. a Satan, Satan. He, he, and so, so it's, and, and I actually, we, we actually have a, um, uh, someone we know that this this was explained to them, and they misunderstood. They thought, is Nehemiah saying that 
Satan is God? No. <laughs> Satan is God's angel that he's using for this particular purpose yeah. to incite Israel. Mm. And that's I don't think that's contrary to what we read in, in the Gospel of Matthew, both in Hebrew or Greek or in Luke. So can right? You- can, can, can in you, other words, Satan, Satan here isn't coming, the devil, yeah. the diabolos, yeah. the Satan, a Satan, whichever one it is, mm. isn't coming here out of his own power mm. to test Yeshua. Quite the contrary. It says, then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Mm-hmm. And then Luke 4, 1, Yeshua, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Lo- Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Mm-hmm. Right? So, so it's not inconsistent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same message there that this is something that the Holy Spirit, that God, you know, I would understand Holy Spirit as um, the way you experience God. Um, let's not get into that whole theology for now. We will at some point. But um, uh, it's God Himself who's bringing mm-hmm. Yeshua to be tempted here, mm-hmm. or the Holy Spirit that's bringing Yeshua to be tempted here by the devil. So the devil's not like has his power, you know, uh, uh, independent of God. Mm-hmm. He does not have that power. So can you do us a favor? For those yeah. that are listening, this is one of the things I used to love about the tap yeah. tap. I used to love this. Yeah. Okay. Can you do us a favor? Can you take yeah. that three letter root for Satan and give us the first yeah. time that those three letters show up in the Tanakh? And I think it's going to be sometime in Genesis, I think around ah, the issue so of the well. So it appears in, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so there's a, uh, it's actually, that's actually really interesting. Yeah. So we have Satan as a verb, Satan as a noun. And then we have sitna, which can mean enmity, mm-hmm. or in one case, it might mean accusation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's this beautiful passage in Genesis 26. Mm-hmm. And, and what I love about it, it, it's a very mundane passage, right? It's, it's, uh, it's about a quarrel between Isaac and these uh, Philistine um, shepherds. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he digs these different wells. And verse 18 says, Isaac dug anew the wells which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, and which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham's death. And why'd they stop them up? Because there's a limited amount of water and a limited amount of grazing area. They don't want these other sheep coming in and, and grazing on the same area where they're grazing. Mm-hmm. It goes on, and he gave them the same names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants digging in the, in the brook found there a well of spring water, the herdsmen of Grar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. Mm-hmm. He named that well Esek because they contended with him. In Hebrew, it's a play on words, Esek, because he tasku, they had contended with him. So the first one was called Esek. And when they dug another well, they disputed over that one also. So he named it Sitna. And it doesn't tell us why he named it Sitna, <laughs> right? It says Yarivu, they, they, they quarreled, they uh disputed, they had a dispute with him, they called it sitna, and sitna means enmity, or or hatred, or enemy, from the word enemy, satan, right? So he called it, there was a well called sitna. Mm-hmm. Is that a well you would have wanted to drink, uh, have a drink from, <laughs> the well of sitna? <laughs> but why did, why did I that, ask you to do that? I'm talking about yeah. that three-letter root of that word, yeah. uh, sitna, and the three-letter root of the word mm-hmm. Satan. Um, and the reason I'm yeah. asking you that question, to look at that, yeah is I'm still back to starting out your cousin says, okay, the Satan, the understanding of what the word means, mm. being adversary, uh, one who accuses, yeah. one who stands against. Um, it, it, it seems like that's, I mean, that's certainly the Jewish understanding of who the Absolutely. adversary or what the well, adversary that's is. that's linguistically what it means. And so imagine this, if, if, if you went today and there was a well named uh, Sitna and you knew it was from the root of the word Satan, you probably wouldn't want to drink to it if, drink from it if you were a good Christian, because you might think, I mean, they literally have a phrase, speak of the devil and he will come, right? Yes. Um, and, and so what we can see here is when he's calling this well Sitna, there's no concept in his mind whatsoever that, oh, well, this will bring a, a certain angel that causes trouble called Satan. Right. Right. He's not afraid of Satan. Right. He's calling it sitna, not because of something spiritual, mm-hmm. but because of something very physical and, and, mm-hmm. and, and immediate, mm-hmm. that there was a quarrel, a fight, and there was an en- enmity over this well. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me just read the last one. He moved from there and dug in another well, and they did quarrel over it, so he called it rechovot, mm-hmm. which means broad uh, and wide, mm-hmm. and, uh, saying, now at least Jehovah has granted us ample space to increase in the land, and mm-hmm. really he has broadened our space to increase in the land. Mm-hmm. And this isn't here in the passage. I'm reading now into the passage what the rabbis read into the passage. They said these, these three wells uh, we could take as a metaphor 
for the first temple for which they fought over us, the second temple which was destroyed by an enemy, and when we build the third one, there'll be ample space and we'll increase in the land. Uh, and in fact, the rabbis would say maybe this is prophetic, mm -hmm. but they understand that's not the original context and meaning when it was spoken of by, by Isaac, but it's a beautiful kind of mm -hmm. um, what we call drasha or homily mm -hmm. that you can uh, uh, explain or talk about based on the passage. Mm -hmm. um, if you were to say, well, this proves there'll be three temples. No, you've missed the point. Right. <laughs> okay. So getting back to Satan, Satan means enmity. We have another use of the word sitna, which appears in a much later period, mm -hmm. and that is in Ezra 4, 6. Mm -hmm. and, um, Ezra 4, 6, in the reign of Ahasuerus, at the start of his reign, they drew up a sitna against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. These are the enemies of Israel. They don't want the Jews to rebuild the temple, so they draw up, uh, and it says, katvu sitna. They, drew, they wrote a sitna. Sitna is a letter of, of enmity, mm -hmm. but it may also at this point have, the, have taken on the meaning of accusation, mm -hmm. or that might be part of the connotation here. I Meaning because the letter wasn't just a letter from an enemy, it was saying, hey, these guys, you can't let them build the temple, they'll rebel against you. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a connotation here of accusation, and that was, the rabbis ran with that to the point where, where they talk about Satan. Satan they refer to as kategor, that is the, the prosecuting attorney. And it literally is the term for a prosecutor, mm -hmm. right? There, there's the uh, defense attorney and there's a prosecutor. And so in rabbinical thought, uh, Satan is not just the enemy, which he is, and an adversary, which he is, but he's also the prosecutor standing before God and doing kind of what he did in the story of uh, Job, saying, well, okay, he serves you, but you only did good to him. Now, now harm him and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But but kategor, that is, um, uh, it's actually a Greek word, kategor. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the Greek word for a prosecutor. It's like you would say in America, the, the district attorney. Mm -hmm. um, the kategor, the, the, the enemy, is, um, is, is this almost like God is, not almost like God is standing, or God is sitting on his throne, and, and there's two different angels before him. There's the prosecutor, and then there, the accuser, that is, and then there's the defense attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, and we actually have that in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, and there Joshua the high priest, or Yehoshua. Mm -hmm. Then he showed Yehoshua the high priest standing before the Malach Yehovah, the angel of Yehovah, and Satan standing at his right hand as an enemy against him, as a Satan against him, which might mean as an accuser against him, mm -hmm. right? So the JPS and the NIV both translate to accuse him. Mm -hmm. That is a possibility here, that it means enemy, but it also means accuser. And uh, in, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, we're not seeing it in the sense of accuser. I think we're seeing it in the sense of, um, of he's coming to do the test, mm -hmm. similar to what we saw in 1 Chronicles 21. But there is that understanding in in... Judaism, and it, and it comes from this place in the Tanakh, that Satan is not only an enemy, he can also be an accuser, just as we have a letter of accusation by the enemies of Israel. Mm -hmm. In Zechariah 2, 3, 2, it goes on, it says, Yehovah said to Satan, Yehovah rebuke you, Satan. Yehovah has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? And, and the, the image we have there is the, that, that Satan comes as the accuser, as the enemy, to say, hey, you've got to punish Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And who stands in Israel's defense? Yehovah does. Amen. There's no intercessor there. There's no intermediary. Yehovah stands up and he says, I rebuke you, Satan. Mm -hmm. You know, you're accusing, I'm going to defend Israel. The judge himself defends Israel. Mm -hmm. So this whole scene with Satan is absolutely fascinating. What we have in, um, in Matthew, we didn't get past verse one. No, no, <laughs> so no. Wanna... Wait, no. I've got three things in verse one, and the next one's gonna is gonna cause there to be a short circuit for you. Your cousin okay. caught it. And I don't know if you caught it. So when we so we went to the end of the verse talking about the personification of the Satan. Excellent information. Um, I don't know. Just before I go on, do we want to do anything regarding sort of how that uh, began to grow and how in Christianity today? Um, we have this idea that, you know, and you, you mentioned it earlier, but biblically, where do we get this idea of God and Satan mm -hmm. being in a, a war against each other versus um, Satan being, in other words, is there, is there something that we can go to 
that would that would give confirmation for the idea that there's a battle between the two. Look, so I mean, I'll state the obvious: the the elephant in the room. There was a religion at the time called Zoroastrianism. There it is. And the Zoroastrians, uh, they they trace themselves back to a, a man named Zoroaster, who they believed was a prophet, sometime around 600 BC. Some people say 1000 BC. We don't really know. Zoroaster. Uh, he founded this religion, which says there's there's two powers in the universe: a good god and an evil god. Mm-hmm. And the good god was called uh, was called Ahura Mazda, and the Ingr- the evil god was called Ingra Mainyu. And at the beginning of of existence, they actually didn't the, the two didn't know that each other existed. One was in the realm above, and one was in the realm below. Obviously, the evil one was in the realm below. I say obviously, but you know because some of that's carried over, um, and and uh, each one is gathering uh, uh, followers so they could, have, they could have a final battle. And, the, and some actually, some scholars today will say that, that Zoroastrianism isn't a dualistic religion, as I would say, that there's two gods. They say, no, there's only one god, because in the end, in the final days, Ahura Mazda, the good god, will defeat Ingra Mainyu, the, the evil god. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there'll be, you know, it's, it's like in that movie back from the 80s, there will be only one. <laughs> Right, only one will remain. Right, um, and so there's the good god and the evil god, and the good god controls over the the realm of the spirit, and the evil god is is the um, is you know is below in hell, and and they're both trying to gather followers, and and this is referred to in the Tanakh. Yeah. Most people don't realize, but the Tanakh actually talks about this. By the way, we talked about this in our book, uh, A Prayer to Our Father. Mm-hmm. Um, when we were dealing, uh, I don't remember what the context was. Yeah, we were, but, we were um, dealing with it as it pertains to lead us not into the hands of a test. Ah, okay. Yeah. So Isaiah 45, verse 1 says, Thus says Yehovah to his anointed, mm-hmm. that is his Mashiach, it says there, to Cyrus. Mm-hmm. Who is Cyrus? Cyrus is a, a Persian king who sometime around 538 B.C. or maybe 516 B.C., he uh, issued a decree saying that the Jews could go back to the land of Israel and rebuild the temple. So Isaiah lives around 700 BC, around 140 years before Cyrus, uh, or before the, this particular event of Cyrus. Cyrus hasn't even been born. His father hasn't been born. His grandfather probably hasn't been born. Mm. Thus says Yehovah to his anointed to Cyrus, mm-hmm. who I, uh, whose right hand he has grasped, treading down nations before him. So basically it's saying here, God is going to give an empire to Cyrus. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to give an empire with treasures and wealth. And he accept, and he says in verse three, uh, so that you, why is he doing this? Why is he giving an empire to Cyrus? Which he does. The Persian empire under Cyrus conquers the Babylonian empire. Mm-hmm. So that you may know that it is I, Yehovah, the God of Israel, who call you by name. This is actually an incredible scene here. Isaiah is speaking a prophecy mm-hmm. 140 years approximately before it will be fulfilled calling a specific person in the future by name hmm. and telling him the proof that Yehovah is the true God is that he foretold the coming of this man by name. Mm-hmm. He says, so that you may know that it is I, Yehovah, the God of Israel, will call you by name. for Not for you, because you're a righteous man, but why? Verse four, for the sake of my servant Jacob, mm-hmm. Israel, my chosen one, I call you by name. I hail you by title, though you have not known me. Yes. What does it mean he has not known him? Isn't Cyrus a good Jew or convert or, or, or a follower of the God of Israel? No, Cyrus doesn't even know who God is. Mm-hmm. He believes in Ahura Mazda, whose enemy is Ingra Mainyu. He believes in the good God, who's the enemy of the bad God. Right? He believes in the bad guy, he just, he just doesn't follow him. Verse 5, I am Yehovah, and there is none else. Besides me, there is no Elohim, there is no God. Why is he telling this to Cyrus? Because Cyrus believes there's two gods. Mm-hmm. I engird you, meaning I, I put you, uh, put armor on you, though you have not known me. And then he says, so they may know from the east to the west. And literally it says, from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, that there is none but me. I am Yehovah and there is none else. Mm. And then this is the one of the most important passages in the Tanakh. <laughs> and we have to understand it in the Zoroastrian context. Mm-hmm. They believe all the good in the universe came from Ahura Mazda, the good God. And all the evil, all the suffering, all the starvation, all the, the, the envy, everything bad in the universe was created by Ayn Ramainu, the evil god. Mm-hmm. And here in direct response to that, Yehovah says, I form light. I'll read it in Hebrew. Yotzer or, he who, I am he who creates light. Uvore mm-hmm. 
uh, who forms light and creates darkness. Ose shalom, who makes peace, uvorera, and he who creates evil. It says in Isaiah 45, 7 in the Hebrew, that Yehovah creates evil. He says, Ani Yehovah ose chol ele. I am Yehovah who does all these things. Mm. Why is he telling Cyrus that? Because Cyrus believes all the suffering and evil and mean-spiritedness and everything bad in the universe is not the creation of the good God, it's the creation of the bad God. Mm. And Yehovah says, I create everything. So Nehemiah, one of the things that was so powerful about us doing the book together was when we got to this section, this idea of uh, God's kingdom. And we'll, we'll get to that later mm -hmm. when we get to, hopefully, if we get to past the pilot episodes. Uh, <laughs> but the thing that changes it for me, and it changed me radically, was when I first became a part of the Christian uh, understanding, I understood that there was the, the one that was going to tempt me, he was called the devil, and the one that was going to bless me, and, and that was God. And then I get to this passage in, in, uh, um, in Matthew, um, and of course, as I was saying earlier, there's some things that change. One of the things that changes is, what is the role of the Satan? Is, is, this, is, this, a, is this like a movie where co-starring Yehovah and Satan, also starring Yeshua? <laughs> well, it's or, interesting that you say co-starring because yeah. our, our, our format for movies and for uh, television is you have the protagonist mm -hmm. and the antagonist. Yes. The protagonist is good, and then the antagonist is bad. Right. And, and, you know, and then they have this subgenre where sometimes the protagonist is a bad guy, mm -hmm. right? But what you're saying is that that, 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 that format mm -hmm. is the way that many people look at, at God's role in history, that God is the good one, and then there's an evil one, there's the antagonist. So Isaiah, Isaiah changes the game for me when all of a sudden mm -hmm. in my English Bible, it won't say he creates evil. In Hebrew it says he creates evil. Now, I, I don't know if with Tap Tap, if you can give a couple English versions, maybe the NIV would be oh, one. Oh, yeah, they, they completely, they completely could you, uh, could you give us a couple it. English versions that take that same phrase that you just gave us, but they change that word yeah. evil oh, to something Oh, they completely else. whitewash it because, because they don't want to say that God creates evil. Mm -hmm. So the JPS uh, from 1985, I form light and create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I don't even know what wheel and woe are. <laughs> And then here, uh, NIV has, I bring prosperity. Whoo, prosperity. He says, I, I, he makes peace, literally. I bring prosperity and create disaster. Mm -hmm. Well, that's already a little bit more dangerous. God creates disaster. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Um, and the King James says, I make peace and create evil. The King James isn't afraid to say it. Yeah. Right? It's saying what it's actually there. I mean, sometimes, you know, King James gets a bad rap. Sometimes it'll have some, what's closest to the actual Hebrew. Gotta like that um, KJV. Yeah, well, okay, but the New King James, which is just supposed to be updating the language of the King James, <laughs> supposed to be doing nothing else. I make peace and create calamity. <laughs> yes. Ooh, God is calamity Jane. Okay. Uh, like, really? That, what? Well, can I, and then can, here's can the I? NET says, um, the one who brings about peace and creates calamity. Mm -hmm. Then they have a long note to say how, yeah, actually God creates evil. Mm -hmm. um, wow. So here's what I wanted to bring up. Uh, yeah. So there's been a lot. We're we're in a we're in a worldwide pandemic right now. Um, and, mm -hmm. and still, as we, we we watch this episode right now, if you're in 2020, unless it's 2050, and you're and you're watching this during 2020, we were in a worldwide pandemic. And and the first time that this came became real to me was when I was in Israel. And what I've always said, Nehemiah, whenever I go to Israel, I always feel like I'm prepared for what's coming. This has happened for me every time I go. I learn something in Israel that prepares me for the future. But the mm -hmm. one thing that happened for me when I got to Israel is I felt in my spirit very strongly that this pandemic that's called a coronavirus, they say we don't know about this one, is that, is that this virus that we're presently living within, it isn't as if Yehovah is up in heaven in asking the angels to take the virus and to put it in their science lab to figure out what this is. Where did it come from? You know, and I know we have all sorts of political issues, what we call it, but would it be fair to say that we have examples of pestilence, not coming from some evil for, for source, but that God himself, Yehovah himself, sometimes, say sometimes, sometimes, will allow things to happen, not so that we get confused about where it comes from, but understanding he is the one, he is the source, who not only is aware of it, but he can stop it or allow it. 
So for me, what happened in Israel was I said something that I, I hope people don't take this as offense. This coronavirus, uh, it, it, it's come from above. It's here on earth to get people to a place where they will come to God in, in humility, where they will, will kneel before him. He says, if I should send uh, this and if I should do that, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn and seek my face, turn from their evil ways, I will heal. And so for me, Nehemiah, personally, I mm -hmm. have had no problem praying to him to stop this virus, praying to him to intervene in this virus, and at the same time saying, Father, I know that any time that something like this happens at this level, it's not something outside of your will or something outside of your ability. Um, it's something that he will use for his glory. So that's about as yeah. far as I wanted to say about that. What you're actually raising is, is the question of suffering in the universe. Mm. Um, you know, wh why do bad things happen to good people, mm -hmm. what they call theodicy? I don't know that we have time to get into that today. But just, I want to read a passage that is quoted mm -hmm. by my cousin in the book, The Bible, the Talmud of the New Testament. And he's quoting the Babylonian Talmud, Baba Batra 10a. Mm -hmm. And it's this encounter between the Roman consul, Quintus Tanaeus Rufus, around the year 127 AD, and Rabbi Akiva. He's the, the Roman ruler or governor over Judah. Uh, and they call him in the Talmud, Tornos Rufus. It says, Tornos Rufus asked Rabbi Akiva, and this is the Greek or, or a Roman, a Latin pagan who doesn't understand the God of the Jews. Mm. He says, if your God loves the poor, why does he not provide for them? Rabbi Akiva said to him, so that through them we will be saved from the punishment of Gehenna. Mm. That itself is profound. I don't know if we have time to get into it. What he's basically saying is by helping the poor, we have an opportunity to do righteousness in the world. Uh, I'm not sure I agree with Rabbi Akiva, but... Um, Let's read on. Tornus Rufus said to him, on the contrary, it is this that condemns you to Gehenna. Mm -hmm. I will tell you in a parable to what this can be compared. It is like an earthly king who has become angered with his servant and put him in prison. And he commanded that he should not be given food or water. And one man went and gave him food and water. When the king hears, will he not be angry with the man? And you are called servants. It is written for the children of Israel are my servants. Okay, so in other words, the king, God in this case, has condemned people to poverty, mm -hmm. and by giving them charity from the Roman perspective, <laughs> you're defying the will of the gods. That's mm -hmm. how the Romans thought of giving charity. Mm -hmm. The Jewish perspective is no, this is righteousness. Rabbi Akiva said to him, I will tell you in a parable to what this can be compared. It is like an earthly king who became angered with his son and put him in prison. So in Rabbi Akiva's parable, the, the, the poor are like the children of God. Mm -hmm. um, and put him in prison, and he commanded that he should not be given food or water. And one man went and gave him food or wa and water. When the king heard, would he not send him a present? And we are called sons, as it is written, you are the sons of Yehovah, your, Yehovah, your God, Deuteronomy 14.1. Uh, so, so there we have this, this, this very brief uh, historical encounter where they're, trying to, where they're struggling with the question of good and evil in the universe. Um, I want to be really careful about saying God sent the coronavirus mm -hmm. for some reason or another. Oh, what I said. Because I don't know why God clear. does what he does. Let me be clear. Not, okay. not, not that God sent the coronavirus. God allowed it. He has control over it. Absolutely. He can do what he wants to do with it. He can use it to his glory. I want yeah. to be clear about that. I just, okay. you know, he's not up in heaven okay. saying, what is this virus? Where did this come? I mean, that's, that's my point. Right. In, in other words... We don't want to fall into this, this, or I don't want to, to say that, well, Satan brought the coronavirus, and that's why they're suffering, yeah. and if only God would intervene. Yeah. It, you know, I, I, I think I've shared this before, but I, I know this guy who's a, a, who's a well-known Christian um, teacher and uh, internationally renowned, and he was once given a job to run a Christian television station, and he loaded up all of his equipment and his possessions, and he put them in a trailer, and he and his wife were driving to the headquarters of the station across the country. And on the way, they had a flat tire. And they call up the station. They say, we're going to be, we're going to be late because we've had this damage. And the people who run the station said, well, Satan has foiled your plans, foiled our plans, and he's uh, prevented you from coming. So let's pray that God will overpower this, the, the will of Satan and, uh, uh, and, you know, and change the events here. And this Christian who was a very learned scholar, he said, well, I have the Jewish understanding of Satan, that Satan is one of God's angels and can't do anything without his mm. permission and without his authority. And on the spot, the man was fired. 
not for denying Jesus, not for denying the Father or the Holy Spirit, but the Christian man was fired for denying Satan. <laughs> that is, when I heard that, I said, wow, what a picture of the way at least some Christians, not all, have, have run with the Satan idea, and Jews to some extent, right? I mean, I, I grew up, um, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll save it for when we get to demons, but I grew up in a world surrounded by the belief in demons, and everything happened. It, well, that was a demon who did it. That was Shadim. That was Mazikin. Right. Well, or maybe just, you know, it was natural circumstances. Yeah, right. Right. May, right. May, in other words, there is an element here that we have to say <laughs> by definition that there's a certain amount of natural circumstances here. If you eat bats <laughs> and you eat other animals that are surrounded by bats, you're going to get coronaviruses <laughs> eventually. Right. Um, right. Look, we get viruses from uh, cows and from sheep and from goats, which God has given us as clean animals. Mm -hmm. There's this amazing book, which everyone I think in the Western world needs to read. It's called Guns, Germs, and Steel. It asks the question, why is that the European world, including the United States, conquered the rest of the world? Uh, or particularly conquered uh, uh, North and South America and the Pacific Islands? This doesn't apply so much to China or India, but applies to, the, and, and Africa. Why did they conquer a Africa as well? And the answer they come up with this, or this uh, biologist comes up with in the book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, is that people in Europe and Asia live surrounded by cows for, uh, you know, they say 10,000 years. And during that time, there was wave after wave after wave of pandemic and to the point where by the time you get to this, what's called the age of exploration or the age of imperialism mm -hmm. in the 15th century and on, the Europeans and the Asians are uh, immune to these diseases, to these diseases that like, you know, they're just all over the place. Yeah, we get smallpox, but by and large, we have a certain amount of herd immunity. And then they go to America and the, and the North American natives are just wiped out by it. Mm -hmm. They're just decimated. Maybe millions die because they've never had the common cold that they have over in mm -hmm. Europe and Asia. And where do we get these diseases? from clean animals, right? So I wanna be really careful about blaming the pandemic today on unclean animals. I think there's obviously an element to that, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's came from a bat, as far as we know, at this point in history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe indirectly, maybe directly, we don't know for sure at this point. But the bottom line is there are things that have come from cows, but we're now immune to those things. Exactly. And uh, so there's a certain amount here that maybe once the population gets to a certain size, mm -hmm. And you're constantly interacting with these, um, you know, it was funny. There, there was a statement by somebody in the public, I won't say who, who said that, well, they, they got this from a bat. And then, then, the, then the people out there said, we need to fact check this. And what they found out is there's probably millions of people every year who are infected by bats, people who live out in the countryside in China. And they, uh, you know, they're, the bats live in the rafters of their house and drop poop mm -hmm. and they get infected. And they get infected so often that there's a certain amount of herd immunity. Um, and so they can survive it. And, and it also, or if they die from it, it doesn't spread because so many people have had it or a mild form of it. So the point here is that I don't want to blame Satan on this. Um, I do want to end with something. I want to jump ahead since we're talking about Satan. And there's so much more here we didn't even get, get to. T to me, the key words in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, whether it's in the Hebrew or in the Greek, is that he was led by the Holy Spirit or by the Spirit. This isn't something that according to Matthew or Luke was outside the control of God. This was something that was under the control, and Mark as well, under the control of God. In fact, it was part of God's plan to lead him to this test. We didn't even talk about the word test. Well, in the plus episode, we'll get the test. <laughs> Wait, Here's one thing I do want to bring. Go ahead. Your, your cousin did something really interesting, and I actually agree yeah. with him. And, and this is based on our, our, our text that we had pointed. Your cousin says... Is this about but, test? No, this is not on test. Okay. This okay. is on the Holy Spirit. It says, after his fast for 40 days, this is what he saw in a prophetic vision. And it seemed to him as if he were brought into the desert and as if he had fasted for 40 days. The truth is that all these temptations would have lasted for more, uh, for more than an hour or two. Point being, your cousin is saying, yeah. okay, Yeshua actually had this happen in the midst of his fasting. After his fasting, he was hungry, whatever. And he had a prophetic vision. Now, I want to ask a question. Mm. Our pointer, when our pointer went through, for, for folks who don't know, we have a, we have a, a Hebrew 
text that was pointed with vowel points, um, which helps it easier for those of us who, who need helpers to read. I think our pointer said be, meaning like in, in spirit or in the, in, in, it, it's not like, it's not in the Holy Spirit. It's like in spirit, right? If you look no, at- No, 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 it, no, no, it, it's in the Holy Spirit. No, no, I'm saying we, what, did, what we, is it? We have your case, we have your case of what's called smichut, of the construct case. Mm -hmm. And since we have ha on the word kodesh or kadosh, in the, the thus the holy that the carries over to ruach. Okay, so it's the holy spirit. You can't say it's a holy spirit. Okay, here. so no, no, not a. It's the holy spirit. The question is this: is 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 that is it possible? So your cousin is saying, okay, he had a prophetic vision. Is there anything that we've known that we've seen in terms of the actual construction in the holy spirit? Examples, and this is a tap tap question. I'm telling you, it's oh, golden. <laughs> it's oh, a tap tap oh, oh, oh. question. I'm asking, so do you have a situation? So that's interesting. Yes. So you're saying, oh, so, okay, so that's why he's saying that. I didn't catch it either. Okay. I'll be honest with you. I didn't catch what, here's why I thought he said that. Um, the reason I thought that um, my cousin wrote that this was a prophetic vision is by analogy to, um, to uh, Abraham, right. who according to Jewish tradition yeah. or Jewish interpretation in Genesis 18, that the whole chapter was, was a vision, yeah. that it wasn't that Abraham actually uh, uh, fed food to three angels, but that the whole thing was a vision. That's how Maimonides interprets it, for example, okay. uh, that he was, he was drawing an analogy for some reason. But you're saying that then Yeshua was taken by the Holy Spirit, that word, that phrase by the Holy Spirit, according to Rabbi Soloveitchik, refers to a vision. That, or, is that what you, I think, I'm asking I think that's this. what Rabbi Soloveitchik. Or could it be he was taken yeah. in the Holy Spirit? Yeah. The idea that he was having, and there's, we'll get to this later in the plus section. I mean, this is gonna be phenomenal yeah. when we get to the plus section, but is it possible that you could interpret this that in the Holy Spirit, he was, you know, it's like, it's like when we talk about, in so in spirit, in, in, in the spirit, meaning something that was, um, taking place uh, in the spiritual realm, if I can say. Here, uh, Ezekiel eleven twenty four. a spirit carried me away, and there it's a spirit. A spirit carried me away and brought me in a vision yes. by the spirit of God to the exile community in Chaldea. Mm -hmm. And it's there, Baruach Elohim, mm -hmm. by the spirit of God. In other words, he wasn't physically carried to see these people. <laughs> uh, it, it was a vision, yes. right? Well, there it uses the word that says in the vision. Right. Can I tell you why I'm bringing this up? Why? You'll have to go up to the plus section, folks, because there's a, there's something that ends in the in the in this in, in it that just makes me think. Well, how did this happen? Well, if it was in the Holy Spirit, it would make sense. So, yeah, that it's definitely a possible way to interpret it based on Matthew, Mark, and uh, and Luke that this was a vision. Mm -hmm. I, I don't see why it's necessary to say it was a vision. Um, it doesn't sound to me like it was a vision, but. I'm just saying, okay. I'm saying when we're reading it, it's possible. Now, we're, we're going to What do we gain go... by saying that it was a vision versus that it physically happened or... No, no, no. I, I mean, mean Satan's not physical anyway, right? I mean, so... <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to go, Nehemia, and I'm hoping that you're prepared for this. I'm sure that you are. So I went and found a book. Uh, this yeah. is a book that I got way back in seminary, and it's called The Synopsis of the Four Gospels. And I went back to this in, in, in seminary like in the Allen, beginning. I have that book. Huh? Everyone, everyone who reads the New Testament needs to have that book. They need to have this book. But anyways, yeah. in the front, in the beginning of it, I put an article. I, and this, I found this, you guys, listen, I went to seminary in 1991 or some, how long ago was that? In a previous century. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what they had us do is really interesting. And this is connected to Matthew 4. What they had us do is that we would go through and we would actually color code. And here I have an example of it. I have an example of it. We would color code the Greek. And the re we would color code, we'd co color code it would be read if the exact same Greek word was in another section. And I'm hoping when we go to the plus section, we're going to talk just a little bit about the synoptic gospel issues regarding um, this particular passage, because I think it's phenomenal. The other thing I want to say is we're going, is I've talked about this before. I call this the three universal tests. There are three tests that Yeshua went through. And these tests, I believe that people go through are going through or will go through at some point in their life. So I think that this, this passage that we're looking at, Nehemiah, is both excellent to study from the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew look, standpoint, look, but one, in terms one last of practicality, it's, it's amazing. There's one last thing I want to bring, uh, although maybe I'll just, maybe I'll say, I'm going to say it for the plus section because okay. 
I feel like we're we're uh, we're yeah. Running we've had we've held you guys long enough. Now, uh, can I can I give them the invitation? Uh, let, first, I'd Please. like to, I'd like to like to hand it off to you. Do you is there anything you'd like to say before we we make this invitation to the plus section? Yeah, look, guys, you know, uh, I really appreciate you supporting what we're doing. We couldn't do this without you. It really takes a lot of resources. Um, you know, I've had people say, "Well, you you should you should put out you should put out one new uh, uh, episode a week." Um, we are struggling at this point to put out what we're putting out right now every two weeks. We're not going to even tell them uh, what, we, what we've been dealing with, right? We're just going to yeah. keep it positive. We, we, we've definitely been dealing with uh, what I think my my friend who is the prayer warrior would, warrior would call spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, please support us out there by praying, by supporting our ministries. This is not my project that I'm putting out. People have, have I've gotten a few people, most not, most are like, okay, I understand. But some people, I've had a few who've complained who said, you know, wh why should I have to support Keith's ministry to get to get part of this? Well, because I'm not putting it all out. Keith is putting part of it out too. And I'm sure you've gotten the same thing. And you don't have to, guys. We just did an hour on basically one verse. Uh, if and you want did... another hour or however long it'll be, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Might be longer or shorter. Then that's part of what we call the, the plus episode. I want to give people some good news. There's something that actually I do want to offer to everyone that's listening, everyone that's listening right now. You don't have to mm -hmm. go to the plus section if you don't want to. If you want to just scratch a little bit of the surface, uh, we did the red letter series. This actually addresses this passage, but we only dealt with it from the perspective of the words of Yeshua, but there's some amazing things you will learn. Free members, you go to BFA International, front page, red letter series. There's 35 episodes that you can go to for free. But I got to tell you something. If you want to get to the depth I want to invite you uh, to the plus episode. Uh, Nehemia, I will tell everyone that's listening, there are some people that get, they say to me, Keith, well, you know, I mean, what are you two doing? And, and, and so how is this working? And then there's, there's a whole lot of other people, Nehemia, that are saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm on the yeah. phone with these people. They're saying thank you. And I want to say again, thank you to you because 18 years I've waited for this. And to have you bring the kinds of sources that you're bringing and the work that you're doing, uh, folks, I want to say before you go to the plus section, support Nehemiah's research, support Nehemiah's wall, go there, become a support team member. The information that he's bringing to us right now, having access to these manuscripts, has not been a cheap issue. <laughs> it cost him a lot of money. And I'm sitting here in a home studio. Half of the things that I have here are because he sent them to me. <laughs> So please, folks, send your money to Nehemiah's wall. I can't let him quit this. This is golden. I need him. I need him and his people to continue working. In all seriousness, folks, we've given, we, I think this will be the fifth episode that if you come to, uh, uh, to the BFA International, go to BFAinternational.com, become a premium member. You will have access to five plus episodes. This is number nine, but number five of the plus episodes for BFA International. Uh, once you become a premium member, not only do you have access to the plus episodes, you have access to everything at BFA International. And by the time we get to number nine, we've got such a goodie for those of you that are premium members. I don't even want to talk about it. So be sure that you do that. But before you become a premium member, please go over to Nehemiah's wall, support the work so that this can continue. Because truthfully, Nehemiah, is it fair to say, as of right now, we have one more episode we're going to do that will be the end of the pilot series and at that point yeah we we, we had talked well what we're gonna, I need, to, to we're gonna is, need to talk about how this is going yeah. we're gonna have to get into the nitty-gritty how the finances are going what the numbers yeah. are it's just practical as much as i love doing this we're gonna have to have a serious conversation about how this works am i right well and look te you know we, we could do we could do a limited run 10 and yeah and we've contributed something i think to the discussion and and yeah and we go go our merry way and I work on other projects Nehemia, can I say one more thing before we get to number 10? Sure. Can you just let people know, just through the first five, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Not premium, not plus, just the people that we're reaching. What kind of numbers have we been talking about of the people that we're reaching? So the first two episodes were downloaded or viewed more than 100,000 times, mm -hmm. which like that number blew my mind. I'm like, is this, is this right? I had to go back and <laughs> double check that. And look, I've had episodes that were downloaded much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but usually it's something with a broader interest than, you know, the Hebrew New Testament. Like I did the episode once where I interviewed the uh, the Palestinian bicycle refugees of Norway mm -hmm. and it had, I don't know, 250,000 downloads mm -hmm. in a week. Um, but that had a broader interest than than this kind well, of is Hebrew the good, information. The good news is this, is that through our websites, through YouTube, through Facebook, through podcasts, 
we've reached a whole lot of people. Uh, there's yeah. a remnant of you that are supporting us, and we now want to take you over to the plus section right now so we can give you more on this. And again, these three universal pet tests, absolutely phenomenal, the way that uh, <laughs> Yeshua addresses uh, his Can I tell you what really excites testing. me, Keith? Yes. Is when I, when I get an email from such diverse people. Mm-hmm. I get an email from someone who is a, a believer in Yeshua who keeps the Torah. Mm-hmm. And then the next day I'll get an email from someone who tells me, I love this program. I go to the Catholic Church every week. And, you know, I was raised in it. My family's part of it. And, but now I'm actually getting exposed to something uh, that Yeshua himself actually taught. Amen. I'll get an email from, uh, from Orthodox Jews who say, Nehemia, we love that you're doing this that you're sharing this information, that you're giving a Jewish perspective. Mm. Uh, some, of, some of it they knew, some of it they didn't know. Mm-hmm. They certainly often didn't know how it applied in this particular situation. Mm. Uh, I'll get emails from all kinds of different people with all kinds, from all kinds of diverse backgrounds and faiths. And I think this is wonderful. I think this to me is common ground, that we Amen. can come together and it's not for the purpose of disputation. <laughs> it's not for the purpose of debate. No. It's not for the purpose of conversion. Um, of conversion. It's for the purpose of walking together mm-hmm. on common ground and understanding the ancient sources of faith. Mm-hmm. I think that's a beautiful thing. So we're going to pray, folks. But before we pray, I want to remind you, please go over to Nehemiah's wall. There's so much over there that's free. Go to bfainternational.com. There's so much there that's free. Uh, but I am extremely thankful for those of you that have determined that you want to journey with us into the plus episodes. Can I pray first and then you pray and then we'll see everyone over at the Bivakasha. plus episode. Father, thank you so much for uh, these ancient texts. Thank you so much for these principles that we can apply to our lives. Thank you so much for the study, the time, the energy, the resources. Thank you for our friends who have gotten us to this point. We're almost up to the end of the pilot episodes, and we don't take it as a small thing. We want to be listening to you. We want to know how we should go forward, if we should go forward, the way that we should go forward. I want to thank you for our editors. I want to thank you for the people that are overseeing this whole process that have put their hands to the plow and have done such a phenomenal job. Thank you for that, mm-hmm. Father. Thank you for your goodness and your grace and the vision and provision in your name. Yehovah, Vinu Shabbat Shemayim, as we're going through this difficult time in the world, this time of this worldwide pandemic, Yehovah, be with the scientists and the doctors who are looking for a way out of this, mm. who are looking for a way to treat it. Yehovah, give them wisdom, give wisdom to our leaders. Yehovah, as we're struggling with other issues going around in society, with all kinds of situations, Yehovah, be with the people and give them the strength to get through these trying times. Mm. Yehovah, I don't know if this is a test that we're going through. It certainly feels like a test. Yehovah, we've, if we've been led into this test, Give us the strength to get through this test in a way that honors you and your holy name. Amen. Amen. You have been listening to Hebrew Gospel Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For a more in-depth study, check out Hebrew Gospel Pearls Plus at NehemiasWall.com and BFAInternational.com. Thank you for your support.